Sir Michael, welcome to Time Team. Um, lovely, to, lovely to be here. Lovely to be here. Um, have you ever managed to watch a Time Team at some point in the past? I have watched so many of them that I'm not sure which I've watched and which I haven't watched. Um, but I do find them fascinating because finally, finally, um, they're all about stories. I mean, I know you, you're digging for stories. I've never dug for them. But um, I've moved in that world where objects are the beginnings of stories. And you can see what's wonderful is that you're rediscovering stories. And that, that's, to me, what's fascinating. You know, and and, and I, I don't know, when we've been to Crete, which we have, um, you know, we, you, you sort of, you always look to the earth to see if there might be something down there that's interesting that you've scuffled up. Um, and there is. The truth is, in places like Greece, there's stuff lying around all over the place. And, um, uh, last year, you know, Homer's home, and we went to the place where he's supposed to have lived. We found neither him, he wasn't home, and we didn't find anything that he'd left behind. But I'm assured that's where he lived. I love talking with Philippa Gregory as well. I love the imagination that lets me be in that place through your characters. And, and, it, and it combines the, specis, the, the, the actuality of the artifact. With that, it could have been like this. And I think I find yeah, that yeah. a very enjoyable combination. Um, one of the things I was going to talk to you about was Michael Foreman's illustrations. Um, yes. And you've used Michael through many of your books. One of the love, things, love, love. Yes. One of the things we did on Time Team was we had a wonderful illustrator called Victor Ambrose. Ah, Victor Ambrose was the person who uh, did the first edition of Warhorse. Ah. The first edition that ever came out in 1982 has the most wonderful cover. And I'll tell you a lovely story about that because it's, it, um, he, he, well, I'll talk about Michael in a minute, but Victor Ambrose was, I think, still around. He's a decent old age now. Um, but Victor is wonderful cover, really lovely. You know what his pictures are like, really wonderfully evocative cover. Anyway, the book didn't do at all well. So they only published something in the region of 500 to 800 copies. Um, the result of that, not the, what a great book it is, but the result that it didn't sell and was never reprinted, is that those copies with the Victor Ambrose cover are now unbelievably sought after by collectors because there's so few of them. And yeah. one of his books the other day went for £1,500, which was, I think, three times what I got paid for writing the book. <laughs> so it's interesting how time travels, isn't it, really? Oh, how nice. I'm glad you know his stuff, because he did the Viking stuff as well, didn't he, Victor Ambrose? Henry Victor, Trees. Victor was one of the first people that I bought on when I was putting Time Team together 25 years ago. Um, there was Mick and Phil, and then I saw Victor's pictures. What interested me about them is he does slightly the job that the imaginative author is doing. It's what you were talking about a moment ago. It's exactly that. He takes what's there and then he links it up. With, he does. He does. He's, but he never forgets the origins of it. That's yeah. what's extraordinary. Yeah. And we had some wonderful times with Victor. We were watching a program about Scion Park. Um, we watch a program together at six o'clock, a sort of time team tea time, it's called. And Victor's picture from last week was of an event at Scion where Henry's coffin exploded and leaked, thus fulfilling the biblical prophecy that someone who had would have no children and all the rest of it would be eaten by dogs, not a very pleasant subject. But mm. Victor's pictures, for me, allowed me to be there a little bit. And it was, it was not the precision or whatever you call it of um, computer graphics, which have a hard edge to me. I don't quite believe it. His sketches had a marvelous life um, and I don't know your cover, but I know he loves, he's a good friend and we've been working together for 25 years. Um, and well, when you speak to him, will you say, will you say hello from me and tell him that story of Warhorse? And will you say, I promise I won't sell, I have two copies of Warhorse, which I will never sell. But I know the fact that the publishers lighted upon him because in a way 
those were ancient times, even when the book was published in 1982. And somehow you had to get the child to travel back. And this is how people look. And he never, never sentimentalizes. I mean, what has happened in film and sometimes in other things is people yeah. sentimentalize your books yeah. enormously. Yeah. And that was just as, there's something about his line, you know, it, 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 it's, he's there and he can see it in front of him. He's one of the, he's really one of the, and like Michael Foreman, I think in a way they're two peas in a pod. They're very, very connected to, uh, to the past, really. I'd like to really discuss a couple of things around what you mentioned, the physicality of the past. I know that in two of your books, at least, um, The Sleeping Sword and uh, The Outlaw, the, the beginnings of those books begin with an object, something found in the yeah. case of The Sleeping Sword, a sword, The Outlaw, a skull. And I wondered what, for you, that physical evidence adds to your stories, your, your wonderful spinning of the legends and the stories. You have physical evidence quite strongly in a number of your books. What does that add? I think it adds, um, it's grist to the mill, but it's more than that, really. I'm not a great inventor out of nothing. There are wonderful writers, people like Philip Pullman, who can go to places, invent places, create places that, that aren't there, but he, he manages, Tolkien does it, all these great, great writers um, uh, have done it. I don't do that. I start from evidence-based, and normally it's evidence of my own memory, which I know is um, dodgy, but nonetheless I use it as evidence. Um, that's the most important source. Uh, after that, it would be um, stories from our own times, just about. So my stories of the First World War, of course, are... Yes, it's from poetry, it's from history books, but always, always, in fact, I try to find some truth um, and then weave my story from that. And so in, in the case, certainly, of the Arthurian tales I've told from the Isles of Scilly, um, I followed in the steps of a much greater writer than myself, a man called Tennyson, um, who was convinced uh, the Isles of Scilly um, was the place that, Arthur was taken to by the Black Queens in a barge after the battle in which um, he'd uh, been mortally wounded but killed his own son. Um, really interesting that, and we won't go into that too much, but nonetheless, there was this wonderful moment, and I, it's what I love about archaeology, the stories behind it. I knew Silly very, very well, um, not archaeologically, but I'd been there for 40 years, every single uh, year for a holiday, so I knew it very, very well. Um, and I was sitting with my wife saying, look, this is, this is where this story's got to be, this sword, this, it's got to be here somewhere. And we knew there were lots of burial places on all the islands, on Samson, on Briar, and all the rest of it. Which one, which one, which one? And honest to God, this is truly what happened. This is the kind of scientific sort of way I do stories. And she said, does it really matter? It's the Isles of Sin. We don't really know. Take a guess. So I literally went, no, 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 like this. And I, um, map, which is what we're doing now, and there by my finger was this island called Little Arthur. So I'm thinking, there's a little funny feeling went up the back of my neck. And of course the island was named because there was this a kind of historical legendary connection between um, the Isles of Scilly and King Arthur. Anyway, I, so, there, so we went there and there were big deep caves there. And uh, I thought, well, this is it. This is where, it, this is where the man stayed all these years thousands of years until he was um, until he was invited back needed him and uh, boy do we need him then and do we need him now um, but all that really came from yes the story of a, of a poet all, also looking for the same source the, the possibility that there's some truth in it because silly was used for a place for burying the great man of the time and um, why I'm not sure and I think anyone's sure but nonetheless there are enough graves around to suggest and in one of them, this will be, um, in a way, the most interesting thing to someone who's interested in proper archaeology, is the discovery, which there was on Briar. Um, I was um, run up by a, a farmer on Briar who had driven his tractor uh, on his field. I think he was planting potatoes or something, and his back wheel had gone down to a hole, and he felt struggling to get out. And the back, and he had a look, and there was this great big hole in the ground. And it was a grave, and he discovered it by accident, broke the top of it, and there was this sword lying there. And I believe an old mirror 
and bits of remnants of cloth or whatever. He said, when you come over, I'll show you. So I went over um, and I stood there and he showed me this very, very rusty sword with a, just a, you could see a little bit of work on it or something. And um, there it was. And he'd raised it from the ground and it, I think it was taken away quite soon after for mission to Southampton. Um, and I'm sure it's ended up in a, in a museum now, which is where it belongs. And this was evidence for me that there were stories aplenty around here, aplenty. And the great thing of physical evidence that people had lived and had their being in this place and had their death in this place. Um, I was used to more recent history. I'd you know, known about the city hours during the First World War, during the Second World War. I'd written stories about that. But this was a whole new game, really. And I, I just thought, well, you know, worry too. So from that, I, I retold, I did two books really, one about all the stories of King Arthur, told to a small boy who's rescued from the sea by some strange man who turns out to be Arthur Pendragon, um, and who tells him stories, and the other is the Silver Sword. Oh my goodness me, you have a copy. I've sold a copy, that's great, lovely. I know Charlie Johns quite well, and Charlie was the archaeologist. He's something of a legend in these parts in Cornwall. And Charlie was sent over to do the excavation of the grave at the farm that you talked about. Right. He did a remarkably wonderful report. This is where, if you like, the stuff of story and legend has one side to it. And at the other end, is a very long, very detailed report. And that's a picture of the mirror. Of the mirror. And what was wow. fascinating about the mirror and what's fascinating about the report, we're talking about 127 BC about for that mirror. And there's quite a few been found in Cornwall. And people occasionally said, well, if it had a mirror, uh, presumably it must have been maybe there was a woman there because people yeah. like to have that sort of balanced point of view the interesting thing yeah. about those mirrors from research that's been done is that they may have been something for seeing the past or the future in yeah you could look into those objects and see the past and the future and so objects found with that sword in that story you told there's a whole sort well, of... Well, that makes much there. more sense to me than a male and female thing. Yeah. yeah. This is not archaeology, but it's close to what you're talking about and what your program's about. But it's archaeology that happened in my mind's eye, but it could have happened. My grandmother um, was um, half... She married a Belgian, and they used to go in the holidays to Belgium every summer. And on a beach, when she was in her 20s, I think, somewhere in Belgium, she lost her wedding ring in the sand. Um, now, because it was like a family holiday in those days, of course, people went back to the same place, the same place, still sometimes do. And they went back to the same place every year. I promise you, eight years later, they went to the same beach and they found that ring in the sand. And I've written a story now, which is about a place called Wick Court, near Arlingham in Gloucestershire. And the reason I wrote it was because we have, my wife runs a charity called Farms for City Children, sadly shut down just at the moment, but it will arise. Um, and kids come from London, Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, and they work on the farm. And amongst the things they do is they dig in the vegetable garden. They plant, so they do all sorts of things. And the last story I wrote, I mean, I've got it written down here. Um, it's called, that's right, it's called, um, I'll get it in a minute. It's called Creepy Crawlies. <laughs> and it's really all about uh, a boy and I dug a lot of potatoes with kids over my years working with farmers and children. They're actually not terribly interested in potatoes when they're digging for potatoes. They're interested in worms and in beetles and creepy crawlers and things like that. And this boy will not get on with the job and uh, he and eventually <laughs> dig, dig, and he comes up with this ring. Uh, and it, everyone teases it's a, you know, a brass curtain ring. And it's about to be a wedding ring, lost kitchen. It was picking beans four or five years before. And therefore, it's a... So the business of discovering stuff from the earth is wondrous to me because it brings up stories. And there's a story about that gold ring, which I won't tell people because otherwise they won't buy the book like you have. 
Um, we've done some projects with school kids. We've done a thing called Dig Village, where we've invited kids in. Yeah. And I, I rather like the idea. I would like to take some of your city kids, I think, and yeah. take them to a site near you. Um, recently, they've done a lot of aerial LIDAR photography around the edge of Dartmoor. And they ah. found some Romano British farmsteads, which well, I that would be well, that would be that would be fascinating because, as you know, they're on they're on a farm, and to be able to go to a, a place which had been farmed all those years uh, ago, that would be wonderful. We'll, we'll keep in touch about that. I should love that. And we've often thought those same skills, the sort of farming, the earth skills. Time team began when Mick and I. Uh, were working on a site around uh, Broadwood Widger that eventually became a huge, a huge reservoir called Roadford Reservoir. 25, yes, Roadford. <laughs> 25 years ago, I went there and they were filling up the bottom of the reservoir. And as the water rose, people dived in, archaeologists, to try and excavate the farms before the water arose. Yeah. But they started finding Anglo-Saxon material under the farms. And people have often thought sites around Dartmoor that you know well, these old farms that have been there forever, well, in some cases, their origins might go to the Anglo-Saxon period. Yeah. And one of the things Mick and I did was went into Broadwood Widger, looked around some gardens, went into the black soil, and there in the black soil was medieval pottery and m material from, you know, 500 years ago. And it's the tactility, when we've worked with children, the tactility of the find to them. It is. It's wonderful, that. It really is extraordinary. And round here, actually, is, um, I mean, as you know, probably, and I hope I'm not saying it wrong, but we have, by and large, not barbed wire fences, but these huge earth um, hedges. Um, and I believe people have done research, and many of them were, were put here by Anglo-Saxons. You know, we're talking a thousand years old. And the field system is still there, field system, unless some silly people have knocked it down from time to time, these hedges. But they're still there, and I walk along my lane here with these, with these hedges, which are high, high, high above the lanes. And I know perfectly well that Anglo-Saxons um, just the same as I did. When they went down to the River Torridge, which is where our, our farm is, they fished there. They had their being here. The whole reason there's a habitation here is because those rivers, the Ockmont and the Torridge, joined, and there were always fish, and there were always fish. And the land, of course, is very rich down on the marsh plains. So it's extraordinary. When, when, you know, that I, I would really think for children it would be the most wonderful way to, to delve into the continuation, really, of who, who we are. That's what we've been... Why archaeology is so important. I shouldn't say this really, but to me it's important because of the stories it tells about us. And until we understand those stories about how we got here, who we are, where we come from, we fail to understand the world around us now. It's just, it's one of the great sciences of the human existence, I think. Really. What, I mean, it's what's wonderful about archaeologists and detectorists, the people who want to go on finding out um, it, it, I don't like to say this, but it is absolutely true. I think it's the child in you that is um, heavily engaged, put it that way. This business, I want to find out, I want to find out, I want to find out. And you don't stop when you found out one thing. It leads you to try and find out something else. And you, and you go where the clues lead you. It's a detectorist is a very, very good expression, really, um, because it is about following trails, isn't it, really? Following history. I was invited um, many years ago, I'm talking oh, 25 years ago, to a school a college in the uh, north of France, where they said, we particularly want you to come because we've all read Cheval de Guerre and Soldat Peaceful, and we know you're interested in the First World War. Uh, would you come and talk to our pupils because they have something they wish to show you? So I received this letter in the middle of Devon, and I thought, this is fascinating. I can't, you can't say no to that sort of thing. So uh, we went over. We go quite a lot to places like Ypres, that, and we went to Vincennes. And uh, everyone was clearly very excited about something. We didn't know what it was, but they were excited about something. Um, and we walked into this class, and there was this unbelievable effervescent teacher um, who had said, well, um, here's the thing. We are in this place where you have but to dig in your garden, and you will dig up some artifact. It's just everywhere.
And sometimes, of course, people are still killed because they dig up things that are bombs or grenades or whatever. Four people a year are still killed in that part of the world. Anyway, um, she said, and we got this huge table where everyone in my class was asked to go away and dig and find something. And whatever they brought, they must bring to the table. So I went uh, into this room and there was this, like a billiard table, huge great thing, full of these artifacts, all beautifully annotated and all the rest of it. It was, it was a mine of information about who had been around Vincennes in the First World War and what had happened. There were buckles and there were belts and there were bullets and there were helmets and all sorts. Um, so I went round and for, I don't know, 40 minutes was entranced by this. And they said, would you read maybe from the books? I read a bit from uh, uh, War Horse. And uh, anyway, they were all very pleased and said, no, 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 no. Now we have something to show you. Um, and we like uh, Paul, who found it, to show you because it is so special. So everyone, you can see, was debated. And uh, I said, well, isn't it on the table? She said, no, no, no. It's too big to go on the table. So I said, well, where are we going then? She said, no, we're not going anywhere. Paul is going to bring you a photograph. And Paul came up and showed me this photograph and was at the same time put up on a wall and just so that everyone could see it. And it was a picture of his back garden and a tank from the First World War. And apparently, and this is true, uh, his granddaddy had been out digging in the garden and it something rust, rusty and, and just went on digging, went on digging. There was a First World War British tank sitting in the bottom of his garden, which was then lifted out, and here it was. And the excitement of everyone, it was the little buckles, yes, it was the little buckles, and I'm sure it was the bullets, but it was just the finding of something like that. And we're living on top of our history. And of course, the truth is we're living on top of our history everywhere, 